daughter's house, worshiping God with us. Zechariah chapter 12, if you'll turn there with me. Zechariah 12. <clears throat> October 7th. Uh, Hamas and other Palestinian terror groups launched a large-scale assault of the nation of Israel. Uh, approximately 50 years to the day since the Yom Kippur attack in 1973. In the first hours of this attack, more than 2,000 rockets were launched. All of them at civilian populations. 2,500 terrorists crossed the border. In the first hours attacked uh, targets. As of this morning, more than 1,400 Israelis have been murdered. All but 212 of them were civilians, many of them elderly, children, some of them babies. This includes 260 that were murdered at a music festival. News video in uh, many of the Western uh, news sources shows uh, uh, a cell phone video of terrorists throwing hand grenades into packed bomb shelters. The Israelis have lived under attack for so long they built bomb shelters. When the attack started, they ran into there. The terrorists knew where they were, began to throw hand grenades inside of them. Children and babies have been slaughtered, people kidnapped, tortured, executed. The Palestinian terrorists went door to door, killing and kidnapping the elderly, children, and women. As a result, Israel has declared war on Hamas. And uh, uh, right now, the Israeli military is poised. They're gathered on the border of the Gaza Strip, poised for a major military strike. But here's the thing about all of that that I've just said, is that it's not really anything new. Israel has been, for the last 75 years, always at the middle of what's happening in world prophecy and in the end times. The Bible teaches us why Israel is always in the middle. I want to preach uh, this morning. I want to shed some biblical light on what's happening in the world. Zechariah 12, I'm going to begin in verse 1. I want to preach a message called Israel in the Middle. It says, the burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness uh, to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces. Though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. In that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah and will strike every horse of the people with blindness. Israel in the middle. Let's talk first about focus. <coughs> Our scripture is talking about the people surrounding Israel. This text is prophetic. It says the burden of the word of the Lord. That phrase, the burden, it actually means oracle or prophecy. It says the prophecy of God. It's a prophetic word. Verse 2, he says, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples. Now, the surrounding peoples, he is not talking about geographical neighbors. He is talking about all of the people that surround Israel. Actually, what this means is all people to the Jewish mindset, the way they would speak. Israel was at the center of God's plan. So God is speaking about all nations. But this is very simple, actually. You cannot go anywhere in the world and escape news about or the influence of Israel. What you see in the nation of Israel in the last 75 years is astounding. It influences politics. Every nation in the world, with very few exceptions, when there is an election, they will ask the politician, but what about Israel? 
want you to think about that happens in South Africa when you're running for president. But what's your opinion on Israel and Palestine? But wait a minute. We're not in Israel. That's kind of crazy when you think about that, isn't it? But that's true in every nation. Because by God's design, Israel is in the middle. It influences the news cycle. That such a small nation and such large influence. But what you need to see is our world is focused on Israel by God's design. God designed the world that you have to look at Israel. Now, the wrong idea is this. Some people think, well, of course Israel is in the news because they're a nuisance, right? We're, there, we're, there is always something going on. It's like, now don't raise your hand, but if you were the naughty child in class, the teacher knew your name. The teacher never knew my name. I was invisible man, right? I didn't do good in school, but I didn't make sound. I didn't make a noise. I sat in the back. I kept my mouth shut. And teachers would be like, I, I know you. Aren't you one of my students, right? See, that's the wrong idea. Some people think that we know about Israel because of the trouble. That is not actually accurate. God has declared and he has designed that the world must be focused on Israel. That is God's plan. God works to draw attention to Israel supernaturally because Israel is a signpost to the world. You know, signs need to be seen. Have you ever been looking for a business and you can't find it because the sign is not obvious? That's a poorly designed sign. God said that Israel is a sign to the nations. That means God wants you to look at Israel. And that is why we are always looking at and thinking about Israel. Isaiah 43, 8 to 10. Bring out the blind, but they have eyes, or the deaf that have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together. Let the people be assembled, because you, Israel, are my witnesses, whom I have chosen, that the world may know and believe me and understand that I am God. God is saying, I am gathered the world to look at Israel and in Israel I will prove that I am the God that I said I was. We see this in history. God said in scripture that he would cause the nation of Israel to be reborn. Jeremiah 30 verse 3, behold the days are coming, says the Lord, I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah and cause them to return to the land I gave to their fathers. This was an astounding prophecy because at that time Israel was a nation. They, they hadn't been taken captive. And yet God says there's going to come a day when I will bring you back and the nation will be reborn. May 14, 1948, Israel was declared a nation. The first time ever a nation has been reborn when it no longer existed. But something you need to think about. When God draws our attention to Israel... It's because he's trying to say something. This week, the whole world's attention has been drawn to Israel yet again. The question is, what is God about to say? Or what is God saying right now? God is forcing us to look at the sign, just like parents do. We will tell our kids, look at me, right? When you say, look at me, there's always instruction coming, isn't there? Look at me, you're about to get a hiding. Hello? No one gives hidings anymore? All right, we're going to do a new sermon series about proper hidings, right? In India, they would say, I will beat you nicely. <laughs> but suddenly, in the last seven days, God's been ringing the bell. He's saying, look, look at the sign. There is something that is about to be communicated. So let's think just for a moment about the kinds of of messages God shows us in Israel, the signpost. We see God reveals his character in Israel and how he deals with them over and over in the Old Testament. You see Israel sinning. God deals with them. Then they repent. There's the lessons of judgment and righteousness or grace and long suffering. Psalm 86, 15. You, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious. So God 
through Israel teaches us about his character. God also reveals his plans through Israel. From the overthrow of Egypt to the salvation of the Gentiles, God always spoke through Israel about his plans. Romans eleven twenty five. He says, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant, lest you would be wise in your own opinion. But listen, blindness has happened in part to Israel so that the Gentiles could be drawn in. Actually, what he's saying is Israel rejected the Messiah for God's purposes so that God could save the Gentiles. That's you and I. God's purpose was to save you and I because we're not Jews, we are Gentiles. And so God revealed that purpose through Israel's rejection of the Messiah. And ultimately, God shows us the time in Israel. You know, a lot of Bible scholars, they call Israel God's clock or the clock of humanity. When Israel was birthed in 1948, that was a crucial event that set the prophetic clock ticking. Things began moving. The, the last days or the end times, they began May 14th, 1948, when Israel was born. But Israel is still keeping time for us. With every move, as the nations are turning more and more against her, we are seeing the minute hands getting closer toward the end. In Matthew 24, Jesus made a crucial statement that you need to understand. The disciples go to Jesus and they ask him, what will be the signs of the second coming? In other words, they're saying, how will we know when you're coming back? And then through the whole chapter, Jesus is teaching them. He walks them through. There's going to be false teachers that claim to be Jesus. He says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be famine and pestilence and earthquakes. He goes through all of those things that we have seen. But then he ends with this. He wraps it up with what happens in Jerusalem. In that scripture, he's talking about the abomination of desolation, literally when the, the false, uh, uh, the, when the Antichrist sets himself up in the uh, temple in Jerusalem. But Jesus says, and when that happens, you better run towards the mountains because it's happening. So I want you to listen to what Jesus is saying. The disciples say, what are the signs of the times? He says, there's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be wars. You're going to see signs everywhere in the world, but then you're going to see signs in Jerusalem. And when you see the signs in Jerusalem, time is almost up. So let's talk about trouble for a moment. The scripture that we read says that people in the world will not be rational about Israel. Verse 2, behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding people. Now, I don't want anyone to feel guilty here, but maybe you can just nod on the inside if you've ever been drunk. And I don't mean on the spirit. Oh, Pastor Heimer. Drunkenness is a very specific thing. He says, I'm going to cause Israel to make the world drunk. You know, drunkenness, it, it's about confusion, isn't it? World politicians are accusing Israel of the things that Hamas is doing. That's crazy. That's what a drunk person would say. Right? I've told you the story before about the man. He was, totally, he was so drunk he couldn't even sit up. He's laying on a bench and I'm walking by and he says, hey, I need some money. And I said, I don't have any money. And he says, you need to manage your money better. You're the guy asking me. I want to tell you, that is every politician in the world today. They are they're looking at Israel and saying, why did you do this? They didn't. Here in South Africa, Alvin Boats, he's the deputy minister of international relations and cooperation in South Africa. He works for Durko. He publicly went on record, released a statement, slamming Israel, accusing them of occupation, war crimes, and apartheid practices. In South Africa, those are big words. 
Here's the problem. They are factually incorrect. By any measure, it is absolutely insane. I have been to Israel. Apartheid does not exist in Israel. In Israel, listen, if you, if you want to go research this, feel free to do it on your own time. Every day for the last 17 years, I want you to listen to those words again. Every day for the last 17 years, terrorists from Gaza have killed Israeli citizens every single day. And yet, in Israel, every day for the last 17 years, the borders are open and people from Gaza go in and work. They have businesses there. Apartheid does not exist in Israel. But yet the drunkenness. God says, I'll cause Jerusalem to be a cup of drunkenness. Politicians are insane. They're, they're confused. They're saying things about Israel that simply don't even make sense. We see this in the United States, in Western politicians and news. There's a supernatural blindness and confusion. Drunkenness also means irrational and wild swings of opinion or behavior. If you've been paying attention just in the news this last week, nations have been swinging wildly on the issue of Israel. In just a handful of days, the world has gone from outrage against the terrorist attacks to just two days ago, we had globally cities around the world, people protesting. They called it a day of rage against Israel. They were the ones attacked. And in five days, we went from how could Hamas do this to the world saying, how could Israel do this? Because God said, I will make Israel a cup of drunkenness. You'll go back and forth. You've seen the drunk that's laughing and crying. That is what is happening in the world today. And then, of course, drunkenness often means violence, both in deed and in speech. October 11th. Two dozen student groups at Harvard University, Harvard, one of the elite universities in the world where we expect to find intelligence. Two dozen student groups, student groups signed a letter blaming Israel for the massacre of Israeli citizens. Even though at the same time, you can see on the news the video of the Hamas, Palestinian, or Iranian terrorists doing it. October 13th, the protests erupted around the world that I mentioned, the day of rage against Israel. The same day, there was a terrorist attack in Paris. A teacher in France was murdered by an Islamic jihadist yelling, Allah Akbar. We see this on the local level in families, in schools, in businesses. People can't agree on the subject of Israel. You start talking about it, people get mad. There's, there's a crisis. Middle Eastern leaders have been openly and on the record calling for Israel's complete destruction with straight faces. They report it in the news around the world. So we see drunkenness. This is confusion and insanity. But the scripture also says that Israel is a weight or a burden to the world. Verse 3, and it will happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. In other words, it's going to be a troublesome issue that people are going to wring their hands over. And that is what's happening in the world today, just like it has been for many years. Leaders around the world are sitting there thinking, what can we do? How do we solve this problem? How do we bring peace? Nearly every nation, every leader has thought or tried to find a solution to the Israel problem. In June of this year, even China pledged to offer Chinese wisdom and Chinese strategy to bring peace to Palestine. Listen, the whole world is feeling the burden, the weight of Israel. How do we solve this problem? We are consumed with trying to find a human solution to a spiritual and a prophetic problem. This is a weight or a burden that has vexed every world leader for the last 75 years. But prophecy tells us 
that the world in its entirety, every nation in the world is eventually going to turn against Israel. Even though there are seasons of support, we have ally, uh, Israel has allies in different seasons of life, that is changing. The overall trajectory is that it's moving toward opposition. Eventually, even Israel's closest allies are going to turn on her. All nations will be arrayed against Israel because of what the Bible says, Zechariah 14 to, I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. Already by this last Friday, the news had changed from the shock against the assault to the rage against Israel. Now Israel is ready. Uh, who knows what's happened since the last time I've checked the news, but they have amassed their military. Now they're going to do what's right. They're going to respond. How many of you know that's right? When someone murders your children, you respond. But I promise you, I'm not a prophet, I'm just a wise man. I promise you, as soon as Israel responds, they will be the enemy. The world, the entire world will turn. They're going to speak about the massacre of Gaza's inhabitants. And no longer will they talk about the massacre of Israelis that's been happening for decades. I promise you. you Probably this week you'll read it. You'll see the headlines, Israel's massacre innocence. That's what you're going to read. But that's only because that's what God said would happen. So let's talk now about perspective. When you look at Israel, you must remember to use the correct lens. You cannot discuss the nation of Israel without using the lens of scripture and prophecy. None of this should be surprising to us because the world has told us about these things. Israel and Jerusalem are always at the heart of Bible prophecy. Our text, verses 2 through 4 in the New Living Translation, says, I will make Jerusalem like an intoxicating drink that makes all the nations stagger when they send their armies to besiege. On that day, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock. All the nations will gather against it to try to move it, but they will only hurt themselves. Listen very carefully. It doesn't matter what you read in the news in the coming days and weeks. Israel isn't going anywhere anytime soon. But I promise you, there's something bigger happening uh, that you and I need to focus in on. What we are seeing right now is something unique. We've seen violence in Israel and Gaza for many years. But what is happening right now is something very, very different than what has happened before. We are seeing an alignment of biblical prophecy that has been millennia in the making. Let's, let's just talk for a moment. Let's get some history. The Hamas group that has taken responsibility for spearheading this assault... They are a terrorist group that is funded by Iran. Now, I want to make sure you're clear on what I'm saying. That's not a conspiracy theory. That's public news. They talk about that. They claim that nobody in the world is ignorant of the fact that Hamas is funded by Iran. In fact, the Wall Street Journal reported this week, Ghazi Hamad, he's a spokesman for the state of Iran, he said Hamas received funding specifically for this attack from the nation of Iran. So I want you to take that fact and hold on to it. Hamas is Iran. They are one and the same. They are funded by them, supported by them. Most people believe that Iran actually helped them plan the attack. But the scripture speaks prophetically about an enemy that's going to attack Israel from the north. This is called Gog or Magog. Most Bible scholars consider Gog or Magog to be Russia. That's the most likely scenario. Ezekiel 38 makes a very an interesting statement. It says that Russia is going to attack Israel, but they're not going to want to do it. They're going to attack Israel reluctantly. Ezekiel 38, God says, I will set a hook in the jaw of what we believe is Russia, and I'm going to draw you down to Israel, along with all of your allies, and amongst those allies is Persia, which has just been renamed in the modern day to Iran. So think about this for a moment. The Bible says 
that God is going to draw Russia with its ally, Iran, to attack Israel, even though Russia doesn't want to. Now, there's a problem with that. Russia and Iran have never been allies. For 2,500 years of history, they have had no connection. They've had no interaction until 1989. 1989, Russia began selling a small amount of weapons to Iran. This began to grow. This began to flourish over the next decades, turning into billions of dollars. Russia has sold uh, fighter jets, missiles, handheld uh, weapons, submarines, navy ships. They have sold billions of dollars of weapons to Iran. Now they have a very strong military partnership. In fact, this is how strong it is. Right now, there's a war going on in Ukraine. You're all aware of that. Russia invaded Ukraine. And Russia faced such stiff opposition from Ukraine. They were shocked. Most of their, uh, def uh, most of their uh, offensive drones were destroyed by the Ukrainians. In steps Iran. In the last few months, Iran has sold billions of dollars worth of uh, military drones to the nation of Russia. Russia and Iran are inextricably linked now. So I want you to think just for a moment. The prophecy says that Russia is going to be forced to attack Israel. They're not going to want to. Probably because they're going to be busy doing something else. Like maybe invading Ukraine. But then because they're allies. Which the Bible says prophesy long before it ever happened, were Iran. They're going to be forced to, what if? Now, Israel, they are known throughout history of being very wise military strategists. What if they do the intelligent thing and they decide to stop fighting Hamas terrorists in Gaza and to cut off the head? Because that would make sense militarily, right? Right? Right, if you, you know, you wouldn't just only do this. What if now enough is enough? And they said, that's it. And they attack Iran. Russia, because Russia is Iran's only military ally outside the Middle East, they will be forced to respond. This is what the Bible says will happen when Russia attacks. Ezekiel 38, verses 2 to 5. Son of man, set your face against the land of Magog, prophesy against him. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you. I will uh, I turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with your army, horses and horsemen, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all with their shield and their helmet. Then Ezekiel 39, 1, thus says the Lord, I am against you, O Gog and Magog. I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will knock the bow out of your left hand. I will cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. You shall fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and all the nations who are with you. I will give you to the birds of prey and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall on the open fields says the Lord. They shall know that I am the Lord. Then the nations will know I am God, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. Now, I am not a prophet and I don't know if what's happening right now is the moment in which Russia is drawn to Israel. But I can tell you it sure looks like it. Never before, listen, never at any point in human history have we been in a place when this specific prophecy has been as close as a trigger. It could happen tomorrow. Right now, we know, you, if you've been reading the news, Israel, they've sent evacuation notices to Gaza, all the inhabitants there. They have amassed several hundred thousand soldiers on the border. 
Israel has already led one excursion into Lebanon. So they've already taken out Hamas or Iranian cells in another nation. They are poised for a massive national invasion. What if they're going into Iran? This is going to happen in a moment of time. Now, I will tell you honestly, I am praying that it doesn't happen because I want more time. I want more time to reach the lost. But church, you have to see this. We are at a trigger point in prophetic history. We're in a new chapter. Now, for the first time in human history, the stage is set for Ezekiel 38 and 39 to happen literally at any moment. Before, you could see it. You could say, yes, if this happened and that happened and that happened. No, no, now we're right there. We are right on the brink. So, this brings us all the entire point of preaching this sermon. This is the issue for you and I today. What are we going to do about it? When the news reads like Bible prophecy, you know what that means? That means everyone is running out of time. I pray that we have more. I sincerely do. But I know it's very short. Every sinner is running out of time. Who's going to tell them about Jesus? Your family is running out of time. The people you know that need Jesus, who's going to tell them? We're running out of time for ministry. What are you waiting for? Because the prophetic clock is ticking closer and closer and closer. Here we see Israel in the middle. Again, as always. And the clock is getting closer to midnight. I, I, would, I would say, number one, you need to get your heart right. This is not the time to be playing around. Because these are the events that surround the rapture. If you're not living right this morning, now is the time. I would say, number two, you need to do what the Bible says in the book of Psalms. You need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Let's pray that they could step back. That we could bring this back a notch. Give our world another season. And most importantly, you need to tell someone about Jesus. Matthew 24, verses 32 and 33, Jesus was speaking. He says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also... When you see these signs that I've told you about, know that it is near. It is at the door. Let's bow our heads together. Thank God every head is bowed, every eye is closed. No one's moving around, looking around just for a few minutes. We are in the presence of God this morning. God is speaking to hearts and lives. He's dealing with people. Before I change this service... There are people here this morning, you are not right with God. As I'm preaching about the end times, what's happening in Bible prophecy, this brings fear to you rather than excitement. And that is because your heart's not right with God. The Bible says that we have all sinned. We all come short of God's glory. None of us are righteous. Not a single one of us. And the penalty for our sin is death. Not just the death of the body, but the condemnation of our soul. And the scripture tells us that there's no human action to fix that. You can be religious, you can go to church, you can do nice things, that's good. But it doesn't change who you are, you are stained by your sin. That is why Jesus Christ came to the earth. <laughs> he came and he died on the cross for you and I. That if we would just be honest and admit that we're sinners, ask him to forgive us. In an instant of time, he would forgive your sin. He would wash away the stain of guilt and shame. And greatest of all, he gives the promise of eternal life with him in heaven. Right now, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, there's people here this morning, you need to give your life to Jesus. You need to ask Jesus to forgive your sin. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand and hold it so I can see it. Put your hand up. God is here. He's dealing with you. You need to get your heart right. You need to repent of your sin. I see that hand. I see that hand. How many others? I see that hand over there. How many others? God is dealing with hearts. I see this hand. 
Over there, I see that hand. How many more would there be? Maybe you're a backslider. You used to serve God, but you're not right with God this morning. You want to be, listen, this is the time. Get your heart right. Put your hand up all across. Join these honest hearts. I see that hand. I see that one, that one there. How many more? There's others. God wants to help you, but you need to respond. If you want to turn from your sin, ask Jesus to forgive you. Put your hand up. Join every one of these that have lifted their hands. Thank God. Hallelujah. Each of you that lifted your hand, I want you to quickly get up out of your seat and come kneel down in the altar. Come kneel down over here on the side, there in the back. I want you to come. Just find a place to pray. Someone's going to come pray with you. I want a man to come pray with each of these men, a lady to pray with each lady. You can kneel down. Hallelujah. Someone's going to meet you and pray with you. There's others here, you didn't lift your hand, but you know you needed to. You need to be right with God. Just get up out of your seat and come. I need some men to come pray here. Three men. Hallelujah, thank God. There's others here, you're still resisting. Just come. God wants to meet you. Hallelujah, thank God. There's others still coming. Thank you, Jesus. Thank God. Listen, this is the time to be right with God. Hallelujah. Thank God for these precious souls. Wonderful Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Wonderful. He's got it right there. Amen. Then Christians, I preached very direct this morning. I believe God's challenging people. I want to give you time to pray in this altar. Let's stand to our feet. Please, would you take a moment, witness to someone near you. If you're not sure if they're saved, ask them. Ask them to come pray with you. Share your testimony with them. This altar is open. Come pray. Come speak to God. Talk to God here in the altar. Spend as much time as you need. Get a hold of God. We'll sing while these are praying. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. With a grateful heart. Yes, thank you, Lord. He wonderful, mighty God. Oh, Jesus, minister and help Jesus people, Lord, cause there be a supernatural dimension of grace.
Hallelujah. Thank God. Amen. I, I would encourage you Christians, we have to remember that when time is short for us, that's good news. That means we get to go to heaven. When time is short for the world, that's bad news. That is why we have to tell everyone we know about Jesus. Amen. We're going to be dismissed in a moment. Remember, tonight there is ladies' choir practice at 3.30. Prayer meeting is at 4. And then we begin our evening service at 5 p.m. Come, bring someone that needs to hear the gospel. Before you leave this morning, take some time, greet someone, show yourself friendly.